Hey, what's up, guys? This is Chad Hermanson with Metal Edge Training Coach. Today, I have my own personal cross-checker in the Angels scouting system, Jason DeRocher. Jason is a dear friend of mine. We've been working together for about six or seven years now. He cross-checks all the players that I see. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his story, how he got to the big leagues. He has some uh, hilarious stories that we're going to go through here. So enjoy this conversation with Jason DeRocher. All right, Dero, what's going on, man? How's it going today? Um, Chad, best day of my life, buddy. Like, I was wondering when you would scrape the bottom of the barrel far enough to get down to me. And we've, I believe your last uh, was Aaron Gagne. So you've gone from Aaron Gagne to you can't even see my hand. I'm like down here below. <laughs> so you are running out of uh, people to interview, and I'm I couldn't be more happy about that fact. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a little backstory here. So. For, for the audience, so Jason is my, my cross-checker. So I cover states with the Angels. I cover Vegas, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, all these states. So Jason covers the same states that I do. And then he also, what do you cover, Oklahoma and Texas now, like half of Texas? And Louisiana. And Louisiana. So you had a state added to you. And we've had, like, Casey Harvey on here before. He talked kind of about what cross-checkers do. Um, we can dive into that, what, what that like is for you and how much you're gone from your family. Um, but on kind of what you just said, so we, Jason and I just played golf a couple of days ago. He drove out here to Vegas. We're hanging out. And what was it about the 10th hole? You're like, so, so what do I got to do to be on your show? <laughs> like, yeah. we, we work together. I, I pitched in the big leagues. Like, what do I got to do? <laughs> no kidding, man. I was, I was starting to take it personally because, like, you started, like, I mean, you've, I don't know how many of these shows exactly you've done, but you come across my social media feeds all the time. So I know you've done quite a few of them, and I was like, either this guy knows so many people and so many interesting people that I, I started feeling bad. I'm like, I must not be very interesting, or he must not like me very much, or I just, uh, I'm not qualified. Um to tell uh, about my mental prowess, you know, I'd like to share with my students just how mentally tough and stable I am as a 46-year-old adult, but uh, here we are. Today has come. We're here. So you, you, you forced me into making this happen. That's, that's what happened. I, uh, I, feel, like, I knew if I got in front of you and I brought it up, it'd be a lot harder for you to be like, uh, uh, uh. Sure. Okay. Or, yeah, exactly. Like you're, you're actually paying me to be on the show. Is that what? So right? what you don't know is I told you that I'm doing this to help you, but what I'm trying to do is become famous, is to become <laughs> some sort of uh, is this a YouTube, uh, some sort of internet sensation. And right. So That's this the is, number one goal. This is step one, in that it's, it's a long process, Chad. It's going to take me at least a couple days to get. That's right. Super, this is the first. I mean, step. we're talking infamous. <laughs> Yes. Is it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> exactly. No. So, it, so in all honesty, so we're on the tenth hole. Uh, we're golfing in Vegas, and I'm like, I go to be to be frank with you. I've just I have decided to kind of just not, I guess, do my work do with my colleagues with people I sure. work. With. I don't know why. I just kind of put it to the side because, like, you're like, we got Ben Diggins, we got Ellison, we got all types of big leaders. We have all kinds of fascinating people. Um, just in our organization, so I could I could do Eric you know, Chavez. You could I could do me. three months of interviews just within our organization. So it was more of uh, just uh, holding off on the Angels part of it. Um, probably you know not, we can edit everything we do here, but like we're gonna probably say something really stupid that I'll have to edit. And nah, not me. <laughs> I've never put my foot in my mouth yet, so no. don't worry about me. It'll be smooth sailing on my end. No, so I, I'm glad that you came and, and we played golf, number one, because that was always fun and, and good. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm glad you wanted to come on because I, I, I had you, um, I call it a queue of people, and I have a plethora of people, man. So no doubt. this is like the 30, the 40th episode. I mean, you were like at least 70. I had you around there somewhere. Oh, I moved up. Yeah. So what, you moved up. So you moved, you moved up on the prep list. And that's exactly what we do. <laughs> Ebbs and flows. Right? You, you were uh, flows. you were peaking at the right time, I should say. Uh, both my golf game and my interviewing skills are both 
in line at this very moment, just peaking right here at the tippity top. So absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So let's dive into because you, uh, for our audience, you pitched in the big leagues. Uh, you were I a did. receiver. Um, I was extremely hard. Let's go all the way back to your high school days. What was high school like for you at Horizon High School in Scottsdale? I loved um, high school. Like, you know, you, everybody hear like the Glory Day song from Bruce Springsteen and nothing could be more true for me than, than that. Like I loved, absolutely loved high school. Um, I played in an era back in the day where you were allowed to play more than one sport. So I was a three sport guy. So I did football, basketball, and then baseball. So I had no days off like summer, winter, like it was 365. And, you know, it was just time with my friends. Like some of my most fond memories aren't of, you know, facing Sammy Sosa and Wrigley Field with the bases loaded or facing Albert Pujols or Bonds or any of that. They're Friday night lights, you know, packed stadium on the football field with my buddies or packed gym on a Friday night for basketball. Like I, I lean more fondly towards those memories than I do actually, you know, having pitched, being fortunate enough to pitch in a big league. So my high school experience was fantastic, um, but it also sent me down a journey of, you know, we've talked about this, you know, like the mental edge that professional athletes have to have because, you know, you're, you know, when you're in high school, you're a big fish in a small pond. You know, there's just, you know, if you're an elite level athlete or you're one of those kind of guys, like the odds of your teammates or the people you play against being at that same level as you are really not great. And so when you get to professional baseball, you know, that was the first thing I noticed. It was everybody was good. It was like there wasn't like a weak link, and there wasn't like you know you're like oh now there's a few guys you're like what's this guy doing here? But for the most part, it was like oh my god, this guy's really good. Oh geez, what is this guy's really good? So it was, um, you know, the high school stuff. You know, that kind of uh, and I'm all over the map here, and I realize that. But with your editing skills, I'm sure you're going to make this sharp and make me seem super articulate. But um, Actually, like, it was kind of like a double-edged sword for me because um, I was a much better football player and basketball player than I ever was a baseball player. And so um, the fact that I made baseball my living and my career was always been strange to me because I always in my mind thought, well, I should be playing football or I should be a basketball player. You know, here I am doing my third best sport, and this is how I'm going to make my living. It was like I'd be, on, I'd be on the mound in a major league stadium and I would have those thoughts. I'd be thinking to myself, what am I doing here? Like, I mean, I should be guarding John Stockton right now. Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I, I should be rushing Peyton Manning or, you know, I don't know. Right. Stupid. But, yeah, yeah, I loved high school. I loved the experience out here. Um, I love the fact that they, you know, they allowed us to do other sports, which, you know, and for, I mean, this is primarily a baseball show, but, I mean, I think it holds true for all athletics. Like, if you're a high school kid and you're of that age and that ilk, you shouldn't be playing baseball year round. It's not good for your body, like to just keep throwing over and over or swinging a bat over and over. I think playing the other sports trains your body in different ways to move differently, to think quicker on your feet. And so I obviously think there's a, a huge benefit to taking a break from baseball and playing another competitive sport, personally. When do you think that timing is? Is it usually the fall or the winter? Because their high school is always playing in the spring. What, maybe in the summer, do you, do you think there's a better time to take off? For me, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, for me, it was, you know, basketball was in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, football was in, you know, the late summer into the fall. And I only played baseball in the summer. Like, I didn't, you know, I didn't play baseball year round because I, 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 I couldn't. I had to play the, you know, I was involved with the other sports. And so, um, you know, I ended up having four arm surgeries. You know, it is what it is. Throwing is a very <laughs> natural motion. But, I honestly think, you know, I had one surgery when I was 19 years old, or I might have been 20, and I didn't have another one for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so I think playing the other sports, I didn't have the wear and tear on my arm and on my body that a lot of these kids, and I'm seeing, we're seeing Tommy John surgeries, surgeries at 14 years old, 15 right. years old. That is insane to me. That should never, ever happen. You know, you've got to take a break. You've got to go and do something. I don't care if you go, go play, go join a band, play the flute, like do something else. <laughs> Or accordion. I'm, I'm, I'm impartial. Just play and do something else. Take a break. And it's, I think, like the competitive travel ball and the club stuff, you know, it's a moneymaker for them. And so it's, you feel the pressure as a player to show up at these events and to, uh, to feel like you have to do this year round. When in, in reality, I don't think you do. I think, you're, I think it's a detriment to, to yourself. Like, we don't need to see you all summer long for 
you know, you, you get the gist. We'll come in the yeah. spring. That'll be enough. We don't yeah. That's that's an interesting thought, and that's kind of what I was thinking too. Like, say if you're, uh, you know, a lot of kids are committing earlier and earlier. Um, we're seeing that more prevalent within colleges that kids will. You it used to be maybe around a time like you might have had a, maybe a tenth grader, eleventh grader would commit maybe at art in the the late nineties. Um, now you're seeing. I, I mean, I we were seeing as early as eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, early commitments, and. It's interesting because they're, they're, even those kids are typically, they may be the dudes at right that age, right? 14, 15, 16. So it seems like those guys in that little small bubble feel like, well, I'm a guy, so I committed when I was 10th grade. So now I could be also a pro prospect. So they probably feel like they can't miss out too. So I got to play spring, summer, fall. And maybe my only break is, you know, a month in December. So what are your thoughts on all that? I mean, I, I personally I don't like it. I mean, I think I think you've got to take breaks. Like it's like you know the big we all played against the kid in little league that had the mustache and that was like a foot and a half taller than everybody. Um, Chad, are you acknowledging that you might have been the kid with the mustache? In yeah, the sixth grade? I, I was. I had a beard at fourteen. You know that I started Perfect. losing my hair at sixteen. It's awesome. Yeah, just <laughs> just a normal progression. Um, I totally forgot what we were talking about there. He was too sidetracked with the other mustache. <laughs> 14 years old. No, I, I think you basically hit on it, though. Basically, you, you, you got to take a break, you know, and maybe – and I know – so. and you played for one of the top coaches Arizona in the state yeah. has ever had. Um, so it was that basically his policy that – He yeah, was crazy support. Absolutely. He loved watching me play football. It was one of his favorite things to do. I was a kick returner, and I would just go – as fast as I could, straight up the field course, gum style, and it led to some amazing collisions because I didn't veer off and I didn't juke. I just went full speed because no one's expecting you to just run straight up the field. They're expecting you to make a move. And so I absolutely lambasted so many people that were not expecting to get run over like in that scenario. And so he would, I mean, he came to all the football games. He was like one of the charters. Yeah. And it was told me like, Years and years after I'd been done that I was like his highlight. He was like one of his favorite things was actually watching me play football, not watching me play baseball. So right. very did you, supportive. Did you feel like, you know, when people talk about like mental toughness or just being aggressive, did you learn that in football? Absolutely. I was always an aggressive kid. I was an undersized kid for most of my life. You know, I didn't, I, my growth spurt didn't come until I was in high school. Um, so I was, you know, a point guard in basketball, I was a running back in football. I was small, and I was quick, small, and, you know, like, football is a game of aggression. Like, if there's, if you're timid or you're passive, you know, you're going to get eaten alive out there. And so, for me, it was the perfect sport because it allowed me to kind of get that out of my system, you know, because basketball is a physical game, too. People don't realize that. Yeah. But if you play it right, it's, it's a really physical game. Baseball is not – you know, you don't touch another person. Like, there's no way – to you know to get that out of you you have frustration and you have like in football if you're frustrated you can you can resolve that issue on the very next play <laughs> immediately <laughs> immediately it's not center like in basketball you can do the exact same thing and but in baseball when you're frustrated you know there's the outlets are you're limited like so i think of all the sports um meant being mentally tough baseball is the sport where it absolutely is the most paramount uh, having played all three for me it was no question because when you're frustrated, you're upset, or you're angry, all you have is time to think about it in baseball. It's a much slower moving game. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, we talk about it all the time in scouting, like when a guy's struggling in the field, the ball always seems to find you mm -hmm. when you're at your weakest moments. And I think that's one of the unique and fun challenges of playing baseball. It's a round bat, round ball. Um, you know, the best in the world fail seven out of 10 times. You know, it's just, it's a sport that's just literally built with failure. And so, the tougher you are mentally and the, the, the stronger you are and your own belief and your own, uh, you know, whatever you want to call that, I think you have a leg up on everybody else that you take the field with. Yeah, absolutely. And you said when, uh, I would have to imagine if you're playing with that aggression in football, because you mentioned to me in the past how you were and what your approach was as a pitcher, that you were 100 miles an hour. Like you were all out, basically max effort. How, how would you describe that? That's you, you, exactly. I mean, I 
from the second I came out of my mother's womb, I grabbed a baseball with four seams and I threw it as hard as I could in that direction and just hope for the best. Like it was a, uh, I didn't, you know, and lucky for me, I, I was around in an era where not everybody threw so hard like they do now. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'd be a dime a dozen kind of guy, but in the era that I played, there weren't as many that did that. And so um, I think you can take guys by surprise when I played because they were so used to seeing breaking balls, change ups, and guys, you know, staying on the edges of the play. That was not my philosophy at all. Right. I aimed right for the middle, threw it as hard as I could, and just, <laughs> you know, hoped it was enough to, you know, hopefully it didn't stay in the middle. You know, it would go to the left or it would go to the right or it would ride or it would cut, you know. Right. Obviously, really hitter can time a jet engine if you throw it enough times. <laughs> so, like, I'm saying it half coy. Like, you know, obviously, I had other pitches, and I, you know, I, I was able to pitch a little bit, obviously. But, my, yeah, my general philosophy from the second I stepped on the, you know, on the mound, I towed the rubber. I was a starting pitcher for the first five years of my career, and I threw the ball as hard as I could from the first inning. Same thing in the ninth. Nothing changed. You know, it was that's just how I went about it. And, uh, it's not right for everybody. I mean, there's plenty of people that pace themselves, and I'm not saying that that's a philosophy everybody should embrace. Mm -hmm. uh, but like we talk about all the time, you know, when we're out here scouting these guys, like you have to kind of tailor your approach to how you are, how you're wired. We're all wired differently. We're not all, you know, rah, go get it. You know, some people are much more, you know, mentally, they're philosophical. They're, you know, they're more, you know, whatever the case may be, not everybody's like that. And you've got to tailor your game to your own personality. You have to have the self-awareness to be able to figure out, hey, what kind of guy am I? What should I be doing? What What's going to be, how am I going to get the best results? And then tailor right. your approach to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. What was your draft story like coming out of high school? Okay, so I was, uh, you know, pretty naive, honestly, uh, to the point where, like, when the Montreal Expos uh, called me in the ninth round, I asked if they drafted me as an outfielder or as a pitcher. Like, that's, like, how little a clue that I actually had. And the guy was, like, kind of taken back. He's like, outfielder. Like, when, did you, when did you hit? I, I don't know. I had some power. You know, I was terrible. Right. But, you know, I hit, I hit some home runs in high school. Right. So, it just, again, that just proved the night, you know, how naive I was about how all of it worked. I didn't even really know the draft was going on. I was out playing beach volleyball with all my buddies. And so I came home, it was on my answering machine. So I didn't even know the draft was that day. It was a different time. It wasn't televised. Uh, you know, I had scouts at home and all yeah. that stuff. Did they, did, so the Expos drafted you. Did this scout actually come to your house and talk to you? Not or once. This, not Never once. Seen, okay. feel anything. I didn't, and when he came in, I, I mean, I, I couldn't have picked him out of a lineup of two people. Like, I had no idea. I didn't even know there was a team in Montreal. I was like, what is this, the Canadian League? Like, this doesn't seem It's right. hockey? And was, hey, hey, take off, you hoser. I'm not playing. I'm not going up there. Um, but, it, uh, yeah, so that was my draft experience. And, you know, I would have signed the first, I, on the first offer. You know, he came in, low-balled me. I was like, fantastic. Let's go. Uh, and my parents, uh, man, they put this poor dude through the absolute ringer. He had to come out four or five times. It ended up taking, like, six weeks. I didn't end up signing until, like, the end of July. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just livid with my parents every time he would leave. Like, we, we would speak. Um, and I, the dollars we're talking about here, it's, it's, it's comical now. Like, mm -hmm. basically, I was a, a high school draft pick, which equivalents to, like, a good senior sign now. Like, that's the kind of money I got. Okay. It was, like, not life-changing at all. I think I think I signed for, like, $47,000, I think it was what, or somewhere in that ring. It was not. But to me, I mean, I felt like a millionaire. It was fantastic. You're like, I could buy a truck. I could buy these things, right? I wasn't even, th I mean, to, uh, I mean, it's just like, I didn't even care about any of that stuff. Like, honestly, yeah. that was the best thing my parents did. They, um, they gave me $1,000. They took the rest, invested it. I still have, still have the money today, you know? Uh, and I spent that $1,000. I think we've talked about this. I think like 12 hours later, I had zero dollars. Like, right. I can't believe it, but like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I can't, I mean, I went to like Costco and bought like those giant things of gummy bears. I feel like, <laughs> I'm all do this stuff that I like didn't even make sense and I blew through that money like within a day and yeah. so I would have spent every nickel and had nothing uh nothing to show for it so it was like literally the best thing they ever did yeah it's interesting when, when we get money just thrown at us as a 17 or 18 year old coming out of high school it's like holy crap yeah you know, like what do I what do I do with this and that's when mom and dad definitely 
can come in and then if it's, you know, like when I went through it, I actually had a financial advisor and kind of what you did one. What put me in, in a place of like, okay, my, I'm just going to buy a, I bought a Yukon, you know, I wanted my own car. Basically, I'm like, I'll have this forever. Um, ended up only having it for a few years, gave it to my brother. Then I got married, you know, a couple years later. And then things changed dra dramatically. So, so you get drafted. Now you have a, a hilarious story, I believe, with your first bullpen in minor league baseball. Oh, God. That was terrible. Like, Tell us what that's about. For the second, I guess, like, back then, the Montreal Expo was, like, they're drafting, like, when they were drafting pitchers, they wanted them as starting pitchers. They wanted them about 6'5", you know, 6'4", 6'5", somewhere in that. Like, that was, like, their prototypical. Like, I would go out there for Instructional League, and there would be 42 pitchers. 39 of them were 6'5". And there was – I'm, like – I was, like, 6'3 and 3 quarters or, you know, just under 6'4". And they literally made me feel like this. I, I literally had a little man's complex. It was mm -hmm. unbelievable. Um, and so I step on the mound, and the guy's looking at him. He's got his arms folded. He's got a toothpick, and he's watching me, and he looks at me, and he goes, you're not sick. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. I, I'm not. There's no doubt about that. He goes, you're supposed to be 6'5". You're not 6'5". You lied on your questionnaire. I said, I didn't even fill out a questionnaire. I don't even – I didn't know this scout that drafted me. I don't recall doing – you know, I didn't do anything. He's like, all right, all right, all right. I get it. All right, go ahead. Let me see your slider. And I was like, slider? What's a slider? He goes, oh. and he starts swearing. He's like, you, like, you have to beep out what he said. And right. He was, and I'm, and I'm, I'm 18 years old. Like, and I'm looking at this guy. Deer in headlights, right? Like, oh. He's furious that, A, I'm not six foot five. B, I have no breaking ball. He literally has to teach me how to throw a breaking ball. Uh, it was I remember, like, at the end of the day, being like, what have I done? Like, I have no business being here. Like, this is uh, – I've made a mistake. Um, they hate me, you know. <laughs> and so – After one pen, I'm not tall enough. I'm not tall enough. I don't know how to throw a slider. <laughs> like, it was like, what is a slider? <laughs> it was. You know, I threw a fastball, a changeup. I had a breaking ball, Chad. It was – little slurvy? It, yeah, I mean – that's like being generous. It's stuck. <laughs> stuck my whole life. You know, I've just never had a break of them. And right. so, um, you know, obviously got, uh, I was lucky. Like, uh, I went to instruction league and there was a guy, we called his name was Mike Parrott. They called him Bird. He taught me how to throw an actual slider and it ended up being a really good pitch for me when I was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did learn all these things, you know, but it was, uh, it was rough. It was a rough beginning for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just being, you know, too short, no breaking ball, um, but competitive. You know, I had I didn't have the same tools as everybody else. Um, but I remember going out there. I signed late, and I remember I led that league in complete games, complete game shutouts. Um, I pitched, you know, basically with one pitch. I mean, I threw a few changeups, but I just got by on being more competitive and just, you know, I guess and, and being naive too, like being so young and so dumb, basically. Uh, it served me really well uh, when I was a younger, uh, when I was a younger player. So yeah, that was that. Yeah, that's interesting because when you, I remember rookie ball too, like going in there, and you're right, like you said earlier, like everybody's good, you know. And then now you're dealing with uh, the Latin player, you know, uh, Japanese players. So it's a whole combination of of all these different kind of ethnicities all combined, and they're all doing the same thing. Yep. And then if you have coaches that are I guess not backing you, then you're like, oh crap! Like you said, what do I do? Like, did I? I probably should have played basketball. Did you ever have those thoughts? I still do today. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, it was. I mean, yes and no. Like, it, it, I got to the point. Like this, this coach that was like that. I, I, I learned to. You know, I came to find out just watching him. He was like that with everybody. Right. So it was. You know, I took it personally to begin with because I didn't know any better. But as, you know, as I went on and I watched him interact with, he was like that with literally every single person. Mm -hmm. And he ended up, like, that was just his personality. I ended up loving the guy. Like, he was right. awesome. Right. He was, uh, to me, a breath of fresh air because he was a straight shooter, which, I mean, you don't run into that that often. Most people have an agenda where they have, you know, or they don't, they're just not straight and up front with you. This guy, like, laid everything out for you. If you were good, he told you you were good. If you stunk, he was real quick to point out that you stunk and what you needed to work on. And so... 
like he pulled the band-aid off for you right you know, like, like barely pulled off you just rip that band-aid off you're just like you got to do this 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 or you're never going to get where you're going and so right. um looking back on it now you know if i had a little bit different mindset i probably would have appreciated it a lot more because he was just being real with me you know mm -hmm. it's like this is professional baseball now this is yeah. not you know we're not in connie mac this is not high school like these are you're a professional you're being paid you you know we expect you to conduct yourself in a certain way you should you know all those things that you don't you know as a 17 18 year old high school kid i had never even showered with a, with a group of dudes before like that was i remember sitting in my life mean, this is obviously off topic we'll probably have to cut this out but i remember just sitting in my locker for what seemed like hours because i didn't want to go into the shower and be naked in front of a bunch of people <laughs> so I remember sitting there like this and then finally this dude from florida comes up to me and goes bro just been there, done that, man. Just pull them sliders off and let's roll. <laughs> Here, take my hand. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's, I mean, just something stupid and silly like that is like, you know, I'd never, like, we didn't shower after games in high school or anything like that. I just got on the bus, went, did all that stuff at home. So I was, you know, I was completely foreign to me. You know, and I go, and I was the guy who would go walking in there barefoot and the guys are yelling, stop, 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 stop. stop. You gotta go get shower shoes, man. What's, what is the shower shoe? Yeah, you gotta you're gonna get funk all over your feet, man. Get out of here. You gotta go see the you gotta go see the club. You gotta get you gotta get shoes on. I'm like, you're gonna wear shoes in the shower? What? <laughs> There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, like in professional yeah. baseball. That you know, these young guys, you know, you don't know what you're getting into. I've never been away from home before, um, so that was an adjustment. Um, you know, going from Arizona to Florida, that's not exactly an easy commute to get uh, right. where you're going. And I remember I was uh, in West Palm Beach. It was about two weeks into the season. You know, I was just throwing bullpens. I wasn't pitching. I was so bored. Um, and I remember thinking, I don't want to do this. This sucks. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm going to come home. So I called my dad and I'm like, yeah, I made a, I, I don't like, I don't like it here. I'm going to come home. And my dad's like, that's fantastic, son. If you don't like it there, you should absolutely come home. I mean, you're not going to live here. I don't know where you're going to live, mm -hmm. but, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What, what do you mean I'm not going to live at home? He's like, oh, we, your mother and I wanted you to go to college. Remember? You, this was your dream. This is what you wanted to do. And so if you don't follow this through, you're on your own. Like, if you want to quit now after two weeks, fantastic. Yeah. Come back, find an apartment, find a job, find a way to scrape it. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound super appealing. And I think maybe I'll stick it out. Um, and I'm glad I did because right. after a week I wasn't homesick anymore you get into the groove I was able to go into the shower with a bunch of people <laughs> have amazing conversations that you should have <laughs> and, you know Chad some you know best, some of the best conversations are in the shower unbelievable right, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing if people but, only knew what goes on in there that so that yeah. that's an interesting point because your parents said hey like that once you decide to become pro, like you're now a man, like you are now yes. on your own and you yep. made the decision to not go to school. So good luck. You know, that's yeah. another, another bit of tough love, right? I, yeah. I think that's an interesting approach. You know, I, and that makes a lot of sense. Well, they called my bluff essentially. You know, I think I was just feeling sorry for myself or just feeling, you know, I don't know if you got homesick the first time you went out or I, I mean, we're, you know, off, we're spaced out age wise. I'm a lot older than you. And so maybe, you know, you were more accustomed to that or not, but I had never, I wasn't on travel ball teams. I didn't do any of those things. Cause like I told you, I had, you know, three sports and they were, you know, all regimented through high school. We didn't travel and go anywhere. And so right. um, that was just something I never even thought about. Like that would be an adjustment or, and like you said, it was hilarious when he brought up all the different cultures. Because I remember I walked through the clubhouse. The first guy I see is what I assume was a black guy. And so I see him when I go walking. It's like, it's the only person I see. I'm like, I'm going to go introduce myself to this guy. I got to find a friend here right away. I got my bag. And I'm like, hey, man, what's up? Jason DeRoche, man, good to meet you. He looks up at me. And he said something to me in Spanish. And I was like, what? <laughs> And I went and sat in my locker and I was like, what is going on here? Like I had I had never been around a Dominican player, a Puerto Rican player, Venezuelan. Like it was like he just looked like a regular, regular guy, like that was at my high school. Right. Except for he didn't speak any English. And so I was like, oh my goodness, man. It was quite a uh, Yeah. Was there a gringo in there at all anywhere? 
And then, What's that? Was there a gringo and all that anywhere? No, so he like, just mumbled at me in Spanish, and I was yeah, like, like a mumble and then gringo, right? <laughs> get out of here! Go. Get, out. <laughs> get away from me! I was like, oh, fantastic! So uh, awesome. you, you and I are buddies, right? Right. So, so you'd mentioned before when, so when you first started your minor league career, you were a starter. Yeah. Right? And then eventually when you got to the big leagues, you were a reliever. Yep. At what point did you become a reliever? Uh, when I lost my prospect status after five years, when they realized you're not going to be a major league starting pitcher. Um, I got, um, there's something called a rule five draft, um, which is where if you're not put on a major league roster after your fourth or fifth year, a team can draft you. And the caveat to that is they have to keep you in the major leagues for that whole season. Well, that happened to me. The White Sox took me when I was 21 or 22. And I was in A-ball in West Palm Beach. And uh, I remember I made it to the last day of spring training. I got sent back. Um, but after I got sent back from the White Sox experience, um, I kind of had a couple of years there where that kind of derailed me a little bit. I, I felt like um, – I was better than I was. Like it gave me a false sense. I, I stopped. I just thought, oh, I've arrived. I mean, I'll just coast now. I'll be in the big leagues in another year. Mm -hmm. You know, this is easy. Uh, and so, I, that's the point where I lost my. Uh, I just didn't pitch very well. I didn't. I just. I thought it was just going to come to me. I didn't have to go take it. And um, and it, you know, being a reliever fit my personality too. Like you know, it, it was pretty evident too. I remember the. The first coach, uh, when I remember when he broke the news to me, he's like, look, you're not going to start anymore, but this is, like, literally built for you. Like, we're going to groom you to be a closer. It's perfect for you. You know, just run forward into a brick wall at full speed every day. It's just what you want to do. And he was right. Like, being, yeah. I loved being a relief pitcher. You come to the ballpark every day with a chance to play, which as a, as a position guy, you know that anyway. When you're going to the ballpark, you know, all right, I'm batting third. You're playing short or center or wherever it is you're playing, and you're going to play every day. But when you're a pitcher, you know, especially when you're starting, you have four days where it's just, you know, it's maddening. It seems like it takes a month before your next turn comes back. So I like the fact that there was at least a chance that I was going to be able to pitch that day. And so that brought a lot more zest for the game back for me. I had a little bit more excitement. And my velocity ticked up a little bit um, yeah. in that role. I just – the amount of adrenaline you get when you come into a game that's already started, there's men on base, you know, it's just a, I just thought it was like a helter skelter kind of, I just thought it was cool. I love being a relief pitcher. Love them. They're undervalued because yeah, there's a lot more to it than just, you know, oh, you're not a starter. You will just, you'll just be a reliever. Like it doesn't work like that. It, it's, it's, it's really challenging and difficult. A starting pitcher you get, Two, three, four is get your groove, get some feel. Like you have to come into the game on point immediately. Yeah, as a absolutely. there is no room for error. It's way more difficult. As somebody who's done both, in my opinion, being a relief pitcher was way more challenging to me than being a starting pitcher. Because yeah. it also like crap most of the time. You know, let's say you throw three or four days in a row, like it's like it's agonizing on your arm, agonizing. Just, just you feel your heartbeat like right here in your arm. <laughs> well, and you mentioned you had four surgeries. What walk us through your surgeries and what what was that like? So I was a miracle baby, Chad. Um, my sur my first surgery in Montreal. I was I think I was twenty, nineteen or twenty. It was right away. It was after my second or third year, and it was I had a I had a full thickness tear in my supraspinatus, and I had labrum issues. And back then, the only way to fix that would have been to open my shoulder up and then sew it back up, which would have been the end of my career. That was a, you can't throw anymore when you do that. Normally it's orthoscopic, you know, you get four little dots. So what they ended up doing, they fixed my labrum and they left the full tear alone. They didn't repair it. And so I didn't know this until after the fact, but I was a legitimate case study for the Montreal Expos for four years. They chronicled everything I did, every, where I went on the baseball field because uh, after the surgery, like a surgeon will give you, will give the organization a percentage to get back to where they were. Okay. And the percentage they gave me to get back to where I was, was less than one half of 1%. So not even 1%. Wow. And wow. this guy's done. Like he's never gonna, this is bad. And they don't tell you that obviously because, you know, so I went to rehab and sadly, 
I got so fat. I didn't do anything, man. I just, I, I remember I'd go, they'd massage your arm and I'd go, me and like the three guys that were there, we'd go to Burger King immediately. I did this every day. Mm. Two double whoppers, fries, onion rings, <laughs> just sitting in my hotel bed, <laughs> sweating. It was like a bratwurst that's like whistling, like it's about to explode. My face was always like shiny and puffy and red. Oh my God, it was hideous. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't take my rehab very seriously in the beginning. I gained a ton of weight. I got super fat. Um, and so I found out years later after the fact, it was going to be bring me back to spring training, get me on the mound, get me into a game, have me throw one inning, and then release me immediately. Right. So they didn't have to – so they can say, you're healthy, off you go. Move so, on. Yeah. So I'm going through all that. It's the first game. And all I just – I happen to notice, like, you know how the minor league fields are all spread out and you got the – so there's people at all the fields. Like there's not usually a huge collection of coaches, trainers, unless it's a like a big prospect is pitching or you know something's going on. So right. I remember the first time I pitched, our entire minor league front office was there. Every trainer we had was there, and they're watching. And I felt like, oh god, they're excited to see me. Turns out they were going to release me. Right. But my first. Uh, Five or six pitches out of my hand were like 93, 94. I'd never thrown that hard yet. Okay. And those were old radar guns. Right. So on one of them, the space shuttle things we have now, God knows how hard it would have been. And so I went through that inning, and they were all looking at it. I remember, like, the looks on their faces. They were like, huh. We didn't expect so, that. No, they did not yeah. expect that. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, and I didn't, I didn't feel like I was any different. You know, I didn't – I felt good. I felt healthy. The pain that I had on my shoulder was gone. And so – uh, I remember they're like, all right, you're going to throw again in three days. Same thing. They're all back there, and I threw even harder. You know, I mm -hmm. started throwing harder. And so, you know, this went on all spring, and then they sent me off as a reliever. I think I went, I went back to West Palm Beach or something like that. Um, actually, no, that's not true. I, I went back out and started. Um, and, yeah, it was good. I was healthy. Um, pitched there for a long time. But come to figure out that they were like – uh, they would always ask me like weird questions about what do I do when I go home? Am I lifting weights? Am I, and the, like the questions they never stopped asking. I never knew, you know, they weren't asking anybody else all these yeah. questions. And then, so it was finally, I was going to be a six year free agent. I was in AAA in Ottawa and the trainer, I, I was like the second to last day of the season. And he goes, I am going to be so glad when you're not here anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I felt bad. I'm like, well, why would you say something like that? And he's like, you have been a nightmare since the, since after your surgery. We have to literally chronicle everything you do because we're trying to duplicate that for other people because that's what he told me. He's like, your surgeon gave you less than one half of a percent to get mm -hmm. back where you were. Not only did you get back to where you were, you were way better than you ever were. So I was, you know, hand to God, man. It's a miracle. Like there's not a, not a medical explanation for why I was able to do what I did, I think that explanation comes from a much higher All right. a much power, you know, so I was meant to do this for some reason. And, you know, it was just, I, I was I, super, super blessed and really, really lucky, honestly. That's amazing. That's so cool. And yeah. then, you, then you finally get um, your call to the big leagues. What's your call up to the big leagues and what does your big league career look like? Uh, it was my ninth season. You know, I was resigned to the fact that I was just going to be a triple-A pitcher, but I love being a triple-A pitcher. You know, you make, you know, you make good money. You know, they pay you, you know, back then they were paying us fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month to, mm -hmm. you know, so for five months, you can make seventy-five to a hundred grand. I mean, who would, I, I'd do that today. I would go pitch triple-A today. Right. <laughs> I mean, today. I would leave today and go and do that. It was right. so much fun. Like, you know, the camaraderie, the hanging out with the, you know. So, like I said, I would have done that for forever. I was okay with the fact that I was not going to be a major leaguer. Um, and so, I was. I signed with the Brewers and was in AAA doing the same thing I'd always done in AAA. I was no different. You know, I, my, my fastball range anywhere from 94 to 99-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I put up good numbers, you know, I, relatively good numbers. Just nothing ever happened for me. And so um, Curtis Laskinik was um, the closer for the Brewers, and he was coming off surgery. So he came down to AAA for two weeks to get, you know, some innings get built up. 
and we became, we forged a friendship. We became friends, and he watched me pitch a couple, three or four times. And he, his locker was next to me, and he was like, "What are you doing here?" And I was like, "What do you mean? What am I doing here?" He's like, "Why aren't you in the big leagues?" Like, I don't. He's like, I, "This is ridiculous." Right. He's like, "You have no business down here. No business." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Well, you have to tell somebody other than me." Like, that's <laughs> you're like, not, "Yeah." You know, I, you know, this is just. I don't make that call. I don't make that call. <laughs> and you know, I was always afraid of like I, I hate brown nosers. I hate that whole persona, and so I was real standoffish with management my whole career. I was bordering on rigid. You know, it's okay to be friendly and say hello to the GM when he walks by. That doesn't make you a brown noser. That makes you a human being. Right. And it took me a long time to learn that because I was so afraid to be a brown noser that I was real rigid with like people in positions of power, which is looking back on it is so stupid. Mm-hmm. Like be friendly, smile. I would just, I wasn't like that. So um, anyway, the scanning kids were called. He goes back up after two weeks and um, actually he hurts himself with us. Like he does, doesn't feel right. So they, they send him back to Milwaukee. Um, I'm driving to the ballpark. It's a day game. And he calls my phone and I'm in the car with all my, you know, I'm, I was driving that day. And so I had two of my roommates and I think I had another guy in the car and we're driving to the ballpark. And he's like, Hey, I'll see you tonight. And I was like, yes, you're coming back. We're so excited. <laughs> uh, we're, and I was like, all right, so we leave for, we're going to Buffalo tomorrow. And then we've got so-and-so and then Pawtucket. So it'll be a fun road trip. We've got right. this bar to go to here. We've got this here. <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. I'll see you in Oakland tonight. And I go, Oakland. He's like, yeah, you're getting called up, buddy. You're, 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 you're coming today. And I was like, you know, I was excited, but this is coming from him. This is right. I, not official. <laughs> and so I'm so glad he told me that because come to the game plays out. We're winning. I was our closer. It was a two to one game. We're winning. It's the ninth. Mm. I'm well rested. I haven't pitched in like two or three days and the phone rings and it's my roommate that gets up to close the game. Not me. Had I not known I was going to the big leagues. I would have tipped our manager's desk over and choked him. Right. Like, yeah. fine. That's, <laughs> so I did have, like, I was peaceful thinking, okay, this might happen because this is my spot to pitch. Like, there's no reason for me not to be in this game right now. And so I remember I got a, um, you know, man, one of the many foul, a lot of foul balls that come down there, I, I flipped it to a kid, you know, here, here's your souvenir. So the coach calls me in and he's like, uh, yeah, there's a couple of cops out here. They need to speak to you. And I was like, police? For what? He goes, you assaulted a kid, I guess, at the game. I guess the kid said you threw a ball at him, and you hit him, and he's got a black eye. And I go, no, no, no. And I start freaking out. No, 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 no. I underhanded it to him. I saw him catch it. This is BS. I didn't do that. And he goes, I'm just kidding. You're going to pack your stuff. You're going to the big leagues. <laughs> why, you know, why do people do that? He's messing with you, right? Thank God, like, because I don't have the personality to deal with that very well. So thank right. God. Again, somebody intervened and made sure I didn't make an ass of myself, you know, <laughs> kind of protected me because A, I would have tipped my manager's desk over. B, I would have got into it with the cop about something I didn't do. Like, it was just, uh, it was pretty cool. So, yeah, I was a 27 year old rookie, you know, which That's is awesome. pretty cool. Yeah, for a rookie. Went out to Oakland. Um, all my friends, all my family, my wife. Uh, I had a really good turnout. I got to throw two out of the three games. Uh, I made my debut with the bases loaded. You know, I came in and uh, of course I just want to easy into it. And so uh, yeah, it was. Uh, and the rest was good. I had my first year. Honestly, the first year I had in 2002 was the best season I ever had at any level. I did in the big leagues. So mm. had the ERA under two. Um, worked my way into being like the setup guy in the eighth inning. You know, we had a pretty established closer, Mike DeJean, who was really good. Um, so I didn't get any chances to do that. But I got to, you know, I went from being the janitor, which is meaning, basically means I pitched when we were up 10 or down 10, mm-hmm. to forging my way into a role where I got to pitch in competitive games and, and more than held my own. And unfortunately for me, um, the next spring I had elbow surgery, and that was one of three surgeries that I would have in a row. I never, I was never the same. So my taste of glory was really only that one season. Um, I did pitch the second season, but I was pitching in a jock strap and shower shoes. I was terrible. Uh, I got, got my ass handed to me, uh, which is what happens up there if you're not, you know, able to do what you're supposed to do. But 
was a great experience. I know you want me to tell that Minnesota story. Yes, I'm waiting. But you know what? In order to do that, I'm going to have to hydrate. Absolutely. So, so yeah, this, this is uh, one of the greatest stories ever. <laughs> it's so great. I have two Proceed. of these. <laughs> so the first one, we're in Minnesota, we're at the Metrodome, and it's interleague. And I, I'd only been up there for maybe a couple weeks, so I was pretty green still. And the old Metrodome, uh, have you ever been there? To the old one? I'd never been, no. Okay, so it's a white roof. And so, like, BP is, like, excruciating. You have to pay attention the entire time or you'll die. Like, you have yeah. to see every ball come off the back. Because once they go up, you lose them. They're really, really hard to see. So, anyway, I'm facing Jock Jones. I throw a fastball, and he skies it. I mean, he hits it straight up, and it is so high. It's like the highest fly ball ever. And so, I'm looking at it, and I'm tracking it. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to catch this thing. So I'm wandering off the mound, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking up, and I start, I start somehow like 360, and I spun around. I wind up, I'm past the third base dugout, <laughs> foul territory. I'm over by Minnesota's, uh, I'm over by their dugout, and I'm screaming, I got it, I got it. I spin around one more time, and I turn around, and Paul Baco, our catcher, has caught the ball at home plate, and I'm screaming down the, down the I am literally, 100 feet away from the ball, screaming, I got it. So I, come, I have to jog all the way across the field. Uh, <laughs> Rick calls me over down and is like, just stand on it. <laughs> don't walk after the ball. Don't embarrass yourself. You can point if you have to. Don't leave the mound again. I don't want you running around trying to catch a fly ball. So that was something that was pretty embarrassing. Oh, it's so great. Enough to have my very most embarrassing moment of my life captured on TV for all of my friends and family to see. So pretty fortunate in that. I'm from Connecticut, and I'm a diehard Red Sox fan. I mean, that's my team. I love the Red Sox. I have since I was a baby. Um, and so we're playing the Red Sox in interleague play. And so literally every member of my extended family is watching this game on Nessie. All the chowder heads back home. They're aunts, uncles, cousins, friends of cousins, grandparents, my parents, friends, family. Also – my 10-year high school reunion is coinciding at this exact same time. And this game happens to be on at the bar where my entire high school is gathered to watch. So my entire school is watching. It's the bases loaded. Kevin Millar is at the plate. And I throw a first pitch fastball, and he fouls it straight back. I mean, he is right on it, right on it. I get the sign. I go into the stretch. My jaw strap breaks. My cup starts sliding down my back leg and has stuck up onto my kneecap of my drive leg. So I'm standing there going, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. So I step off the mound, and I just take off running into the dugout. I don't say anything to anybody. I run off the field. So down into the dugout, pull my pants down, throw my cup off, put my pants back up, sprint back onto the mound, hang a slider on the next pitch, grand slam. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it was on ESPN like for it seemed like remember when Mark Sanchez had like that butt fumble and it was just <laughs> over over I must have seen that play out and then everywhere I went the rest of the year like Wrigley St. Louis Cincinnati somebody would call me over and be like dude what happened man did you puke did you have to poop what happened man why did you run off the field and then so yeah. obviously yeah, you automatically think, oh, he he had the squirts, right? Or he's, yeah, he had a bad well, long night last night. He's got to go throw up in the dugout. I would just if I had to barf, I told everybody, I didn't just, I didn't just, I don't honk right on the mound like that. Yeah. That would be. Um, I think I've actually done that before somewhere along the way in a ball, like one of those hot summer days. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we've all seen somebody, you know, honk on the field at some point. Like it's not <laughs> super. That I wouldn't have run off to do, but all the other stuff I would have. But, good, right? Yeah, oh, those were two of the most embarrassing. That's, That's sure. amazing. That is so. I, we got to find that. We, we don't. I, I've never seen it. I gotta, I, oh, do you have it on tape at home or anything like that? So, uh, Millar just played it last year on the, you know, he has that show, the MLB. I, I forgot what it's called. Hi, he, I don't know. He has a, some show on the MLB network and he played it. Uh, and so, my, my phone started blowing up. Yeah. Like, one randomly at like three in the afternoon on like a Tuesday. <laughs> I look, I 
15 texts, people like videoing it off of the TV. I had like six or seven. So yeah, it's, it, it, you can find it if you really wanted to. I would, I, I don't suggest looking for it. Uh, we're, everyone's gonna be searching for it now. That's gonna be amazing. We, 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 we want to laugh at our experiences, right? That's, <laughs> that's funny. No, at the moment though, it was, I mean, literally every person I knew saw it. Like everyone, everyone. Nice. Was, uh, yeah, well, nice for you, bad for me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your, you, you transitioned eventually from being a big leaguer. You had some more surgeries. You can't lift your arm, you know, all these things at this point. W at what point did you say, how, how did you become a scout? So um, one of my best friends since the third grade, his name's Tim Huff. He actually worked with us in LA a, few, uh, a while ago. He um, was an A-ball pitcher in Toronto and the writing was kind of on the wall for him. And so uh, their scouting director, like he was like still pitching an A-ball and they like had a conversation with him down in the bullpen. And they were like, we kind of think you'd be good as a scout. Like we think you should transition into scouting. You're probably not going to be a big leader. Um, but we think you have a really brilliant baseball mind. We think you can do this. And so he became an area scout somewhere in the Midwest. Um, and he had been scouting, uh, by the time my career ended, he had been scouting for almost 10 years. He was a national guy with uh, Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. And the Four Corners job came available. And so, as you know, it's not what you know in this game. It's who you know sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really challenging to get into the game of baseball, like, at this level. And so I had a quote-unquote sponsor. And so he opened some doors for me to allow me to uh, become a scout and Honestly, I love being an area scout. I miss it. I would do it tomorrow. Like, it's so much more fun to me than what I do now. Like, as an area scout, you are the liaison to your team. You get to know these kids. Yeah. You get, you know, I, I like all the, uh, I like getting in my car and driving to New Mexico and trying to find a diamond in the rough. Like, it's like a hunt, an adventure. Uh, you know, there were so many things about the job that suited my personality. And it's a way to compete. Like you can beat your peers if you're willing to put in the extra work. You know, it doesn't mean it'll always show up in the draft room. You know, that's a topic for another day. Right. But you can do your part to beat your colleagues. And I liked that about, because I'm a competitive person, I like to compete. And so I like that I could, you know, I could still do that on a much lesser scale. Um, and I'd always been in baseball and I'd always been curious about, um, you know, because take me, for example, in high school, when I signed, I was six, three and a half, 180 pounds. Mm -hmm. And when I pitched in the big leagues, I was 227 pounds. So 47, I mean, how do you look at a skinny kid like that and say, oh, yeah, he's gonna have 50 pounds on, he's gonna throw eight to 10 miles an hour harder than this. It's, you know, I found that part to be interesting and intriguing. Um, well, plus you're, we have to factor in how many whoppers you're gonna have. Over the next Correct. 10 years. The whopper, the ratios are really challenging to figure out because they vary. Um, you know, it's a, yeah, for real. And it's, um, like, I, I, love, I love being an area scout. I think you guys are the most undervalued resource in today's game. Like, it, um, it's, uh, to me, it's embarrassing. Like, you guys, like, without you, like, you, Brian, Billy, like, I couldn't do my job. I know that for a fact. I hear guys complain all the time about their area guys, and I feel sorry for them because mm -hmm. I'm blessed to have three guys that not only do I like personally, but I respect, and I know they know what they're doing. And so you're only as good as the people that you work with and around. Um, and so you guys have made my job immensely easy. Like, I don't worry about, you know, you guys not knowing who's who or what's what. It's I sleep really, really well at night. And, a lot of my colleagues and peers do not. So, in that end, I'm uh, I'm grateful to have you, Chad, um, and the other guys as well. Um, I'm blessed. These guys are, you guys are away from home. You're in your cars. You're driving around. You're not flying. You're staying in a Fairfield Inn in Gallup, New Mexico, after <laughs> the heels of 900 miles in your car. And you know, I think, you know, as an industry, we've forgotten how. You know, most of us all started in that exact role. And I think the further away you get from that role, I think sometimes people just forget that, you know, the importance of it. And I know, uh, you know, early on in my career in Tampa Bay, we were rewarded for our work. Mm -hmm. Like, I got guys all the time. 
you know, RJ Harrison was the scouting director there. And uh, if he, if you put the work in and you were convicted and he, and he knew you, uh, especially on like day three of a draft, yeah. like we got to get guys. And so, you know, it's not set up like that anymore. You don't have the same, you know, impact or the same pull, you know, everybody's got a model, everybody's got, you know, all this data that they go off of. And so the, you know, the area scout has kind of been, I don't know, pushed to the side. And I think it's a huge mistake. I think, you know, if we would, if people would listen to you guys, organizations, all of them would be better. Like you guys know your players, especially, you know, as a cross checker, who do I go see, Chad? What, what kind of players do I go see? The top one, of the draft, right? The, top the good of the draft. Ones. Top, yes. top 200 guys in, or yeah. in my area, the top 50 to 75, whatever that looks like. Yeah, I, I don't get far enough. There's not enough days for me to see the yeah. kid at Dick State or the, you know, the clo I can't sit on the closer for BYU. I can't, you know, I mean, there's just, there's just not enough time to do that. And so if you have the right guys and you have, uh, and you trust them, you're going you're gonna to hit on some guys on that day three. That's how you save your draft. Like, your first rounder is not always going to be who you think he's going to be. Your second rounder is not always going to be who you think he's going to be. Right. And so, you know, you've got to have those late round picks. And some of those guys have to pop for your draft to save your draft in some cases. And I, I really like that. <laughs> um, you know, I was fortunate enough to get, I don't know, I think I, got, I signed six, seven, maybe eight big league players. And most of them, you know, from the sixth round on, including, an un, you know, I have a, I, I signed one guy who's an all-star. He was undrafted. 50 rounds wow. and so yeah it, not an exact science and so there isn't a computer program that's going to tell you what they're going to do there isn't like nobody knows if i knew i would work for myself i wouldn't work for the you know whoever i would own, I would own an island somewhere if i knew who, <laughs> what you know it's just really really hard um then the area scout job is the hardest of all of them like it's the hardest it's way more challenging than what I do now. And I miss it. I yeah. Do. Well, and maybe to kind of paint a picture too. So in comparison with the area scout, like, so like my job is to go and know all the players in my area, but then I also have to go gather data. Um, some teams do testing, eye testing, um, oh, yeah. psychological testing. And that's sometimes that's done through a third party on like a computer program. But it's the fact that you have to go physically as a scout, go do that with 100 players. Time consuming. Very time consuming. And the reward at the end of the day sometimes when you only might get what selfishly as a scout, maybe one, maybe two or three guys, you know, you're like, man, I put in a lot of hours to get one guy. Um, so it's interesting. So then that from your perspective as a cross checker, you'll say, hey, or you'll look at my, my pref list or my top follows. So you'll go see those guys and, you know, that maybe the top guy at Arizona, Arizona State, a lot of the top colleges, and then you're going to have the surrounding high schools and junior colleges. So I may have 100 guys on my list, but you may only get to maybe 20, 25 of them, whatever that number looks like, because you don't have personally enough days because you have eight states to cover. Right. That's, it's, it's a challenge. That's, you know, we're, the way we're set up, we have a lot of scouts, you know, for the angels, obviously. And, um, that affords us the opportunity. You know, we, we do crossover, you know, we get extra looks that way. Uh, and I think that's good for everybody's development. Like you get locked into your guy from your area. Like, Oh, this is the guy, this is the dude, this guy is shortstop. He does this, he does that. And then it's good for you to go and see, Southern Cal's version of that very same guy because it gives you yeah. gives you perspective. You're like, oh wait a minute, my guy's not quite what I thought he was. This kid here's pretty good. Or yeah, it holds up. You're like, hey, yeah. I mean, this is this kid's from Southern Cal. He's getting all this press. My guy is, I think, a little undervalued here. You know, he doesn't have the same press clippings. He isn't from the same. You know, he doesn't get the same. You know, looks that everybody gets. But this from a tool to tool, like they're really really close. And that's a way you can be. You know, other you can beat teams, you can beat clubs by, yeah. you know, having that information and then following through on it. And that's yeah. the part, that, you know, that's the hard part because you don't have any control over who gets picked. You know, you just, it is what it is. What would you say in regards to, I don't know about you, but I get messages, whether it's mainly on social media, um, younger, younger fellas trying to get into the game of baseball as a scout. 
any advice you have for them on on doing so, basically? Well, like I said, man, I, I had, uh, at least in my opinion, and I'm biased here, but I had as good a resume as anyone to get into baseball. I played for 13 years. I was a, almost a lifelong minor leaguer. I got to play in the big leagues for a little while, so I got a taste of that. I mean, in 13 years, think of how many players I saw for comparison's sake, and I struggled to get into it. I had to, I had to know somebody. I went on three interviews before I got a job. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a really challenging, um, it's really difficult to get into. Like you could be the most qualified guy, but if the position in the, in the scouting director has a buddy or has somebody they know, or then they're gonna get that job even if they're not qualified like you are. And so it's, it can be frustrating, and it can be daunting at times, but you've just got to keep knocking on the doors. You've just got to don't take no for an answer. Uh, be visible at the ballpark. Um, those years where I couldn't get into scouting, I took a job as an agent, like a runner. Like I was a yeah. – I, I didn't do anything with contracts or anything, but I just went to games, looked for talent, fostered the relationship, and then handed them off. And I did that as a means to be at the ballpark, to get to know scouts, yeah. to get to learn the lingo, to get to – you know, be visible so they could say, oh, this guy, he's always here. He's, you know, and I think that's one means to help you. Uh, there's something to be said for being visible at the ballpark. Um, you, you're not going to hear anything. You're not going to get any information if you're not there. Um, but getting into it, you know, it's – now it's, it, it, it seems like it doesn't matter your background. Um, it's a little different me, now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. For personally, you have to have played. I mean – a little bit to, to, to do this job. It's like, how are you going to sit there in a, in, a, in a high school setting or you're going to tell that player what professional baseball is like if you've never done it? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's one thing to read it from a book or from a manual, but it's another. I think one of the advantages that we have as former players that we should take advantage of and we do is our experiences, sharing them with families. Like, as, as stupid as the shower thing seems, like, that's something that a kid might think about. Like, oh my God, I've never, oh my God, okay, yeah, all right. There's, there's a lot more to this than just, I'm a pitcher, I'm a hitter, I'm a, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And I think, you know, being able to share your experiences, both good and bad with families and being honest with them. Um, I used to try to scare the hell out of the high school kids. I wanted them to be scared to death to do this because it is hard. And then, I mean, you and I both, we went out of high school. And so, you know, we're, we have, you know, experienced that. We know what that is like, and it's, it's not for everyone. Like, mm -hmm. I saw so many talented kids get eaten alive because they just were not ready. They weren't ready mentally. They weren't ready, um, you know, they needed more time to grow up, you know, to, and I would put myself in that category too. I just got lucky, slid through it. But I saw so many guys just get eaten up with so much talent, so much more talent than I had, mm -hmm. you know. There's way more guys that don't get there that are super, super talented for any number of reasons. There's so many pitfalls along the way. And I think, um, you know, it's just, it's really hard. You know, what we do is really hard. Playing is really hard. The whole game is hard. Like there's nothing easy about baseball. And there's certainly nothing easy about scouting. It's, you know, how many times have you gone in and seen, you know, this is the, this is the, 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 the hard part about cross-checking. You know, like I'll be on, you know, we'll talk about a guy. Oh, mm -hmm. Jason, I saw this guy a weekend. He was, you know, he centered the ball like eight times, two home runs, two gappers, made a gazillion <laughs> plays in the outfield. You should have seen this throw he made from the corner. Then I go, he's 0 for 4. He strikes out three times. He takes a lackluster infield outfield. Um, and so, you know, the look I get is exactly opposite from the look that you got. Right. And so we got to talk about it now, right? And we got to. Yeah piece together, what do we have here? And I think that's where, like, having, you know, amongst your scouts, having some, you know, camaraderie, having a trust, a mutual respect for one another. Like, I go to games knowing full well that I am not the expert on this player. I, I feel that way every time I go see one of my guys play. Uh, I'm not the expert here. They have seen this player way more than I have seen. And so I'm just getting a snapshot of what the – so that's the, the other part of having really good area guys is they can paint the picture for you. Um, so even if you see them on a tough day, and it also goes for not just on a tough day, but you might see a guy play out of his mind, right? 
The guy that you're just lukewarm on, and I'll go and I'll be like, how many times have I said, Chad, what about the center fielder, man? Three for four, two doubles, stole three bases, and you're like, Jason, look at last week's box scores. Punched out nine out of 12 times. You spread <laughs> 33%. Like, yeah, yeah, you saw a good weekend, but that's not who this guy is. Yeah. This is who this guy is. Yeah. So, you know, that's where I don't think every organization has that connection, you know, with their with their guys. And if you have it and you have a and you're in a place where, you know, you have the ear and people listen to you, I think you can do really good things. But it's just having all those things line up in this day and age, really challenging. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And then then we're dealing with the aspect of, you know, you're married, have two kids. What what's it like? for your family life? You know what? It's hard for me and me only. And I say that because my kids don't know any different. Yeah. This is, you know, the, I'm their dad and this is the only dad they have. And this has been my job since the day they were born. And so to them, weird would be dad gets up at seven and comes home at five every day and he's in a suit and he, like, that would be really strange to them. The fact that I come and go and I'm here and I'm not, um, is normal to my children. Right. It's only hard on me when I'm gone. You know, it's the it's normal to them, and they're you know, and that's the hardest part. You have to um, you have to be okay with that, knowing that you know you're not shorting them. Like you're providing for your family. This is how you do that. You go out on the road. You go like that is your job. And so, you know, to me, you know, it's really only hard for me. And oftentimes, Amy will tell me, "Man, when I come home, I screw everything up." mess up the schedule you know how it is like you know they get into a groove man they yeah. get into a and then you come home and you screw that whole groove up like you get up early to try to make breakfast because you want to be the hero and they're like this isn't what we do this right. isn't our game what are you doing like you're screwing everything up here and you're like oh sorry so we, we just blend in is what you're saying right yeah yeah, yeah. Just, just, just stay out of the way right <laughs> stay out of the way. but you know I, I i have a wonderful wife who does literally everything here and so i have it so lucky like i don't have when i go off to go to work that's all i got to worry about yeah i just worry about work i just have to worry about getting to the game evaluating that player and getting that player right, right. she has everything locked down down here i don't have to worry about where are my children are they going to get to their practices are they gonna it's she's got this it's a well-oiled machine here man yeah so i'm like so lucky to have the wife that i have because without her i wouldn't be able to do this you know and I, this is i love this job I do, you know, and it's taken, you know, a pandemic and seven months of uncertainty um, to kind of re, not re-energize, but just to, I, I mean, I, I realize now how much I, I, I like what I do and how lucky and fortunate, blessed I've been to do this, to be in the game of baseball for almost 30 years, you know, as a player and a scout. It's, uh, right. and I've been, <clears throat> I don't know anybody luckier than me, honestly, Chad, I really don't. That's how I feel. Yeah. No, that's awesome. No, I agree. It's like we've all been home now for a certain amount of months, and we've had to kind of, I don't know if you call it recalibrating, but it's also like, man, I've been able to spend more time with my kids and my wife than I have in a long time. Yeah. And, it, and it's been it's been pretty cool in that regard. It sucks that we're not working right now, but at the same time, like, man, we've, you know, my son's a senior. My daughter just moved back in because she couldn't afford to, you know, live out in a college life by herself. So it's like now they're home a little bit more. We're, we're having a good time. We're laughing and you're making and, the best of it, right? And yeah, just, you just you do, do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah it's uh, my family. I, I mean, I can't speak to yours, but mine are getting sick of me. They're ready for dad. To, Is it time to go? Yes, yeah, might be time yeah. for dad to go uh, here pretty quick. And lucky for them, you know, October's going to be pretty busy for me travel wise. I got to go to Texas a bunch, Louisiana, and got to do all that stuff. So they'll yeah. be ready sooner rather than later, but. Like you, yeah, I've enjoyed, uh, I've tried to enjoy um, as much as I can this extra time with them because, man, you blink. Like, my son just turned 13, and yeah. it seems like, you know, I wasn't changing his diapers that long ago, man. And it is, like, and now he's just, I want to be with my friends, my friends, my friend. He doesn't want to hang out with dad. He doesn't want to, you know, yeah. he used to come to the couch with me. And now I got to go up to his room and physically grab him, come sit down on the couch with me. Yeah. Couch. <laughs> Like, it is interesting when they become teenagers, how they just, they have their own lives now. And you just, you just hope for a little like 10 minute blips or even five minutes, right? Yeah. Hey, yeah. you come watch this show. Hey, 
c come read a book on the bed like we did when you were a little kid, you know, something <laughs> like that. So, yeah, it's, it's that's uh, kind of those are the precious moments we still hope for. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Still it's like voice is changing, you know, his body's changing. It's like, uh, you know, and I'm here to. I, it's like, I, thank God I'm home for all this because I would come home and I wouldn't recognize him. Like he's a yeah. different kid. Yeah. You know, when they start to grow up, man, it's like they, they go from a little, like that, their face changes from that little kid face. <laughs> they start to start to become a man. It's like, it's so cool to see it happening. Like yeah. right, like it's, uh, and I'm excited to see what he does. You know, he's a happy <clears throat> kid and I'm, uh, my, both my kids are awesome. I'm, I'm yeah. lucky. That's great, man. You have a, uh, we'll kind of wrap this up. I, you've, I've been giving me, you've given me more than an hour. So this has been awesome. What, oh, uh, any advice you have as we kind of wrap this up on, you know, you were like you mentioned earlier, you were a max effort. I'm going to go a hundred miles an hour and that works for some, doesn't work for others. What advice do you have on regards to, um, the, their own mental edge? What, what would you say was yours? I would say this to, to kids coming up now. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You're not weird. You're not unusual. You're not, um, it's okay to have doubt. It's okay to, like, all of those things are super normal. Like, and if you just keep it all bottled in and you don't ask questions and you don't ask for help when you need it, you're not going to perform. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to loosen up your body. Your natural talent's going to seize up on you. So, I wish I would have done a better job of reaching out. Like it doesn't have to be, uh, it could be, it could be a teammate. It could be a coach. It could be a mental coach like you. It could be any, whatever avenue you want to, whatever outlet you have, your mm -hmm. parents, girl, whatever. Like if something is bothering you or something is weighing on your mind, talk about it. Right. Ask questions, get it off your chest and be open-minded to what some of the feedback might be. I wish, I would have had um, someone to talk to, you know, somebody to bounce some stuff off. I just kept everything bottled up and I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. But, you know, it's a lot easier. You know, my wife is, uh, comes from a therapy background. Mm -hmm. she, she has a master's degree in psychology. And so she was a therapist. And so um, we don't do that in this house now. Like if I have, we have an issue or we have something to talk about it. Right. And it's, it's life changing, man. Like uh, it's it, it just frees everything else up. Like and it's like the anxiety goes away. The you know, and you're able to just move past whatever it is that's bothering. So that would be my advice to these guys. Like, don't be afraid. You're not. First of all, you're not alone. Everyone, the best of the best, they all have their own mental. They all have the devil on their shoulder, and they all have the angel. Everybody does. Right. And so that's what I would say. Man. That's awesome, man. And to you, I have only one suggestion. Maybe lose the beard and just keep the mustache. I, I've tried numerous times to do that when I've, when I've had to shave or something, and I, I've tried the mustache. And you would have a Tom Selleck mustache. I can it, see it right now. It is so horrendous that it's, yes. it's, it's – if you're looking for laughs, it's very it's, – it's amazing in that regard because I, I never had a really bushy. Why is it so dark here? But not here. Hey man, it's it's really gray right here. You know, it's but not here. I don't know. Can you defend yourself, Chad? Why is your mustache black and your beard gray? I I do not dye. I've tried dyeing in the past and it burnt my skin. So <laughs> you'd look if you just start with the black mustache. I could go like the old cowboy, right? I got a baseball card that had the the handlebars. You could, you could look like the UNLV mascot if you really wanted to. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Fear the stash. Hey, I'm starving, man. I'm on that intermittent fasting thing, and I'm, I'm 20 minutes past where I can eat. So I'm yeah. excited to eat. Thank you so much for having me, buddy. You're getting hangry, man. <laughs> well, this has been awesome, man. I'll see you soon. We'll play golf soon. Yep. Enjoyed it, Chad. Thank you. Thanks, man. We'll see you. See you, buddy.